All right, everybody. Hopefully we're good to go. Everybody can hear me. Um, I think we're getting ready to start here. Okay, awesome. All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Joffrey Black. I am the program director for the Los Angeles Film School and welcome to Barrier Breakers. Uh, so we're going to be talking about uh, our, with our special guest today, I'm gonna to get into that. But before we get into that, we're gonna have an exciting chat. And I know that people are watching, you're gonna have a lot of questions. And so in the bottom, you'll notice up here, you're gonna see the Q and A here. Um, please ask all your questions in the Q and A. And usually when I'm hosting these, I, I get nobody answering questions here and they're always asking in the chat here. So I definitely want everybody to ask all your questions. and. Most likely they're going to pop up along the way, but we got an exciting guest to talk about his journey here. And so let's go ahead and get started. And uh, what I want to do is introduce our guest here. Um, he is an alumni of the animation program for Los Angeles Film School. His name is Marlon Rivas. And so we'll just give a short round of applause for Marlon Rivas. How are you doing, Marlon? Doing good. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Good. Awesome. So uh, we're going to highlight a little bit of your work here, um, what you've done so far since you have been with the school. I think we are ready. I'm gonna bring up your reel here. Just stand by. Awesome, here we go. Amazing. So it, it's been uh, about four years, and I just want to remind everybody this event is being recorded, but it's been four years. You graduated in 2018, is that correct? Yeah. So that's a huge body of work. I mean, we're highlighting some certain projects out of that, um, but you've done quite a bit of work in those four years. I think over 35, 40 different projects, is that correct? I'd say about like 20, 24. <laughs> some, oh, some wow. I'm, I'm sort of exaggerating. <laughs> But a, a lot of, yeah, every time I talk to you, it feels like, hey, I'm work I worked a little bit on this and then I went on to this and I went on to this. So it's still quite a bit of projects in there. Um, definitely uh, one of the cool things that you were doing that I heard about recently was Stranger Things season four and that that's exciting. Um, I know a lot of people are binge watching that. And we're start now that it's starting to conclude, we're watching a lot of these different pieces come out and we're gonna get into talking about that um, now I want to go back to uh, where you grew up and like the beginning, where you're coming from. I know you're originally from uh, California. Is that correct? Uh, I'm most, from El Salvador. El Salvador. Uh, okay. I immigrated here when I was about seven years old and I, uh, I, grew, up in, I grew up in L.A. L.A. Okay. And then cool. So and you're also a military veteran like me. Thank you, man. Military veteran. And um, wh when did you serve? What time? What years? I served between 2007 and 2012. 2012. Okay. So how did you get into wanting to do something like this? There was a lot of time when we were deployed where we had a lot of downtime. Mm -hmm. And uh, all we had was just time to just watch movies. <laughs> there was a lot of sitting down. There's a lot of like just chilling. Yeah. We just had time to watch movies. And enough of that 
uh, a day will make you be like, I want to do that. I want to do yeah. that. I want to do that. <laughs> so you started to believe now, where are you at illustrator? Did you play a lot of video games as a kid? Did you um, want to make movies? I used, to, to- I, I used to doodle a lot as a kid. I used to spend a lot of time in school doodling, just um, drawing stuff. Some of my friends tell me, he's like, dude, I remember this one time you drew a jet dropping bombs. I don't remember none of that, but a lot of people apparently did. <laughs> and so, all right, so you get out of the military. Um, how did you find Los Angeles Film School? I had known about it since, let me see, 2002. Wow. Those, were, those were like, well, actually like 2001, 2002, because um, at the time I used to frequent Amoeba a lot. Yeah. I go to Amoeba a lot and on my way to Amoeba, I used to see right there at LA Film School. And it was one of the two things that I wanted to do. I, I told myself I wanted to, I'm, I'm going to either go to the LA Film School or be a chef. <laughs> and uh, one of those things came about actually. So you know about 2001, 2002. So that's way before the animation program started to get started. Um, so you probably were mostly interested in film at that time. And then how did you discover the animation program? Um, before, when I got out, mm-hmm. I realized I had all the uh, backing and support that I needed to go to college. And um, I started looking at, you know, like I said, the LA Film School. And um, I started looking through the programs at the time. There were four programs available, which was the animation program, film, um, uh, music, and uh, recording. I believe that was what it was. And um, I ended up going with the animation program because I was like, "There's that looks like something I, w- I would really enjoy. It looks like something I would really want to do. Okay. And you're, you, so you sign up, you, you're, you're part of the program and everything. And what I remember, so I had the opportunity and the chance to be an uh, instructor in some of Marlon's courses and everything. And you're, you're going through school. So what I know, to, know about Marlon is that um, being the best student doesn't mean you're going to be the best professional, right? You're going to get that opportunity. And I can say that Marlon wasn't always the best student, but he was always prepared for uh, the professional world at that time. So how did you discover, because by trade, you're a compositor or what you probably will call a generalist, because I see that you can do a lot. What, what is your title? What do you go by right now? Currently, I go by generalist. Okay. And, and explain what that is to our audience, because I think a lot of people have different definitions. But for you, what is a generalist? So um, for me, um, well, the way that they've defined me as a generalist has been uh, my ability to do many different disciplines uh, in particular in the visualization world. In the, in the previous and post game, game, uh, taking a shot from beginning to end, from tracking it to animating to lighting and then compositing it all together. But just um, the ability to do a lot of different things to bring that shot from beginning to end. Uh, yeah, does that. So uh, definitely in the post is part of it in the phase, right? Uh, the previous post is, it's just, it all falls under the visualization, uh, what I call the visualization game. OK. All right. So you start LA Film School. You're in an animation program. When do you find your identity? Because a lot of students will come in. And many of them are maybe, hey, I, I draw or I play video games, but I don't know anything about this position. How do I, how did, what, when did you start to know this is who I'm going to be? Um, I started getting into character, uh, character modeling. Mm-hmm. I got into the rigging part of it, which I really enjoyed because as a kid, I really loved action figures, posing them out, playing yeah. with them and stuff. You know, I really, I still like that. <laughs> I still like playing with action figures. I don't care. But yeah. um, uh, I, I got into the whole rigging part and I got into the environment part. But then, um, I mean, it's kind of a toss up between that. And then I got into compositing, into uh, uh, nuke compositing. Okay. And just um, what the ability, the skill to bring everything together and just manage that node graph. Yeah. Really drew me into that. I was like, okay, this looks difficult. This looks hard. I want to learn this i want to do this and i'm glad i did because there's like there's a lot of there's a lot of compositing happening all the time right right um in a lot of people they don't know about compositing going in did you know about compositing did you know that that was a job did you Not know that yeah and it, it is and it is the process of taking elements to make a you know a completed shot 
So sometimes you have a, what we call a, a, a blank plate or plate that's given to them with a film. So maybe in, in a movie like, um, like Top Gun, you know, where not everything could be shot and they, they didn't want to put the actor at risk. Maybe they're going to put them into a, a green screen or blue screen, which they didn't for a lot of Top Gun. But just for example, if they had to, then you would fill in those other components that are missing. So maybe like the sky or other elements, right? So, um, so you're, you're getting into uh, compositing at that point. What were some of the challenges that you were facing while going through school that relate to what you see with other students? Um, trying to not get discouraged because there was a time and there will be a time, and mm -hmm. I say this to a lot of students, where there's gonna be a time where you're gonna be like, why, what, what am I doing? What did I do? Why am I not landing work? Why is this so yeah. hard? Why is nobody, you know, it, it happens. It's going to happen. Yeah. Um, a relative of mine called it the muck and mire. And I'll never mm -hmm. forget that. You know, I still talk about that. So that, that was a challenge. Um, uh, every, everything else is just, uh, I mean, pretty normal. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, just trying to figure out, like, just trying to not get discouraged. Right. So try to, what are some of the things that you would do? to stay motivated, to stay, because I think, I think a little bit of this, um, you're going to get discouraged. You're going to feel a moment of why am I doing this? Like, especially when you're in school, why, what, I'm, what is it, what, what am I trying to achieve? Um, and then you, you bounce out of that because maybe you, you saw a really awesome movie, made you play a really great game. What were some of the things that you experienced while going to school to motivate you, to bring back that motivation, bring back that spark. I noticed a lot of fellow students, aside from like playing video games and watching movies, mm -hmm. you know, but that, that's small. But um, I noticed that a lot of uh, peers and students, they would in, they would involve themselves in the in the community, whether it be VFX or be games, they would involve themselves. And um, I started I started getting involved with uh, events, I remember Kevin Bannerman would send out like, hey, who needs volunteers for this and this and that? And at first I was like, eh, whatever, you know, I'm not, I, don't, right. I, don't know, I don't know about that. But my wife was like, you should probably go a volunteer. And okay, <laughs> I did. And as soon as I did, the community involvement really does um, get you motivated because uh, you realize who's doing what and who can get you help you get somewhere even if it's not just a recommendation even if it's just you knowing somebody and you listening to their story because a lot of these community involvement events have involved like somebody telling a story about how they got to where they're at how right. they could be and what are they doing and what some of the challenges that they're facing uh further on down the line in their career that later on you're like oh wait i'm there now <laughs> I'm right here. Was there any story in particular that stood out to you that says, hey, that that speaks to me, I, that's good, that that I'm, I'm experiencing that right now. And if this individual overcame that, maybe I can I can be that. Is there any story that you remember anybody? So there was there's this producer of mine. Her name is Ruth. OK, she, she's a good friend of mine. She um, helped me. She helped me out a great deal. And uh, when I first got in and um, she was at a panel one time given a uh, uh she was she was she was a participating in a panel i'm sorry where she was talking about the challenges that she faced when she was working abroad like i'm talking she was in new zealand doing some work over there and i related to that because i thought of myself like i could totally go out there i've gone like halfway around the world and i could probably do that too and just i kind of want to be there i want to be at that point where i want to go work abroad and then be like um kind of kind of overcoming the same challenges that she was overcoming it sounded like deployment in a way <laughs> it like a deployment in a way yeah yeah it's um a lot of students are trying to figure out when to leave the identity of of, of being a student and going out and going i have to be the you know the entry-level professional at that point and it, it has to happen while you're in school and so the, uh, is the community that you're talking about um, in some of the events that you went to, uh, the Visual Effects Society, that was one of the things that you volunteered at. Is that correct? 
Yes. Uh, when at that time, um, let's let's think about it. It was probably is it 2018? I think it was in your last year when you were starting to do that, right? I was I started to volunteer like mid 2017. Okay, cool. And so talk about your experience going over there. What were some of the things that they had you do? Because I think some some students get worried and think that they that they have to have a particular criteria. Their portfolio has to be in a certain way. What is it really? What was it really like for you when you volunteer for that? And what were the things that they asked you to do? It was um, some of the things that I, I, I it was just simple things I was doing to help them out with their events, you know, running chairs, running wire, holding mm-hmm. a camera because they're recording something. Just simple little things that um, just they themselves would like a little bit, of, a little bit of assistance with a little bit of a hand with, you know, and they really do appreciate it. They're very appreciative. All the all the all the members of that community, they're very appreciative of your presence there, regardless of like if your portfolio sucks, because mine sucked, I swear. <laughs> my, my real sucked. I'm not going to lie. So and they're just appreciative of you and your eagerness and your willingness to be there. So, OK, and that's great. I'm glad you talk about that, because it, if you're doing that while you're in school and it's and I, I call it, you know, uh, being in the safety zone, hey, let me let me show while I can still have time. I still have you know money to donate to this for school or put towards school so that I can work on my portfolio instead of afterwards where I got to get a job and try to deal with that. So you're doing that. And who are these people you're talking to? Are they uh, are they professionals that work in the field? Are they part of the studios? Um, who who is the people that you're volunteering for and that you're able to have these conversations with? Man, there was a mixture of like um, CEOs. There was a mixture of like some uh, VFX industry OGs. Uh, mm-hmm. Like I'm talking, they got stories of like VFX from the 90s. You know how they were like, it was like rock stars back then. You know, just, just straight up OGs from the, yeah. from the, from the 90s. Um, and yeah. there was also a mixture of like younger folks like, like myself that have already established themselves, that have already have a name, they already have a reputation, they already have clout. And they're already um, in some kind of circle and some kind of click where, hey, you got a friend right here. You've already left a good report with and they're going to recommend you. They're going to set you up right here and recommend you to somebody else. That's within their little click right there, their little circle. And um, uh, yeah, and uh, as well as um, some of the board members of, uh, of the VES as well, them especially, they were very, very good, like very good people, very nice then they were very appreciative of like my eagerness to just try to be present and just try to help them out. So uh, you're volunteering. How long did you volunteer for? Uh, You mean like before I landed my first gig or? Yeah. Yeah. Or like, yeah. Before you started, I started volunteering in like what I want to say May, 2017. Uh And I went to like more events that way. And it was a lot of, you know, great networking opportunities all the volunteering that i did right there and come around about october of that same year i was at an event that the one the event i told you earlier when my friend ruth mm-hmm. she she just went out of nowhere like who's, who's who's trying to get on something who's trying to get on the show and somebody else was like marlon he's cool he's right here he's good he's like, oh, yes and i'm just right there rolling up a cable like huh <laughs> okay i'm down thank you so much i would appreciate it and um in a week i had a i had an interview with uh with one of the with, with the owner of proof inc and he asked me hey um do you know how to rig and skin characters <laughs> and that's how it happened you remember i told you earlier i got really yeah. into like modeling characters and rigging characters as well and it just it was just the sheer luck i, I want to say it was sheer luck and just like um friends believing in me yeah uh somebody asked me do you know how to rig and skin characters i just so happen to do yes <laughs> and but did you at that time because this happens a lot with students and you know this you have a lot of conversations with our students um and, and, and young people coming into the industry they don't feel like they're proficient enough to say i can meet their level so they have their own standard at that time, did you feel like, hey, you were ready to do what they said? Or you're going to go, I don't know what they're asking for, but I'm going to go try. Yep, that's exactly the latter. I was like, <laughs> I don't know what they're going to want. I don't know what they're going to need, but I'm going to go and give it my best. I know how to yeah. rig a human. 
All right, let's see what they got. And when I got down in front of that computer, the first thing I was given to rig was a barracuda fish. That was for Aquaman. <laughs> Well, and I yeah, had, that's it, I had right? No idea for a minute what to do. I was like, okay, I I'm stunt. I'm yeah. stunt. You know, and um luckily I haven't ran into like any fellow artists, any peers that were not willing to, sh- to help me out to share their skills, but um you know, you they're aware that you're that you're starting out. The majority of them are aware. They're not going to throw you into the fray with some hyper complicated stuff that they know you can't handle. That's why they threw me with a barracuda fish. <laughs> well, and that's, I'm going to get to everything you just said right now. I want to, I want to remark on one thing. Um, you're in school. You talk about, you're still in school at this time. You talk about your portfolio. is not ready to go, you know, and your first opportunity is Aquaman. That's amazing. You know, I would I think a, a lot of students would love to do that. Um, what do you really attribute landing Aquaman while you're still in school when you don't have the strongest belief in your portfolio? What do you attribute um, most to that? Eagerness, just the eagerness to be involved in the community. Mm-hmm. And um, I mean, I used to also as well talk to a lot of the people. That's how I know a lot of a lot of their stuff right there. Just eagerness and um one thing that a, a lot of us in, in our industry kind of suffer from is just being introverts. You got to step out of that. And yeah. I'm not so much as a, so much an introvert, but I do kind of get nervous. Like, oh God, I'm going to go talk to this dude. I hope I don't like make, make a fool out of myself. I hope I don't, mm-hmm. I don't uh, say anything dumb. And for the most part now, they just, they're very receptive. A lot of industry professionals are very receptive. I think I have yet to run into somebody who was just off putting or just didn't want to talk. Yeah, I think mostly what I try to identify with people, especially with our students, is that are you a true introvert, you know, or you have a social anxiety or are you just don't go out of your social circle? You know, so that for me was my thing. I wasn't going out of my social circle. I was just staying within certain groups. And so watching, let, letting people know professionally, you know, when you step out of that social circle, things happen. So we'll, we'll talk about uh you doing the uh, barracuda and working with people who are saying we want to set you up for success because there's the other there's the other idea that students get is that i want to work at a big triple a studio such such as pixar many years later so i can be fully prepared i said they're not giving you woody you know or buzz lightyear your very first you know day that you're getting there you may never ever get that. They mean that you know, that responsibility is going to go to somebody who has been responsible for uh, big big time work. And I wanted to talk with working in the community in the studios. Now, did you ever meet anybody who was put off with you asking questions, um, you having to say, "Oh, you're the new guy," or you know, "I don't network with uh, you know certain people." Did you just run into somebody who was just a jerk? about the whole situation? Um, maybe like once to a degree, but I wouldn't really, I wouldn't really harp on it too much because it wasn't really that effective, you know? I come from the military. You want to be kind of a jerk? Okay, cool. I, I mean, I, I've been with bigger jerks. You know, you want to grill me because I don't know this? All right, I guess, you know? Right, right. It's a matter of not taking it personal because yeah. at the same time, um, uh, you gotta you, you you gotta realize that you're working with, as well with people who are trying to meet their deadlines and they got their stresses and they got their uh, worryments as well. Okay, so you, you get Aquaman and you're you're you graduate. What is the next year like for you? Um, so you know the the project's not going to go on for long. So Aquaman wrapped, and. Um, uh, then graduation came. I, I got on Aquaman before graduation. So that was like January of 2018. And in April, I was out of, um, uh, I, I was already graduated. Um, I looked for all kinds of work. Eventually, I found niche work where I ended up um, doing 3D animations for a litigation support company. And that's cool. That's fine. Because, I, you know, I got to do something that I... Uh, that, that, that I have the skill to do Maya after effects, all that kind of stuff, you know, 
And yeah, there's, there's niche work out there too. And, um, there's a, there's kind of a, I want to say there's a mentality you got to have where you don't act like any work is beneath you. Just take it. Get, you know, if it's there, you can do it. Go ahead and do it. Don't expect that you're going to get paid a big old fortune right away. Right. You know, but that's going to get you some experience. I'm sure that's counted for something. I'm not, I don't know where, but I'm sure that's counted for something where I've been, Hey, look, I did some 3d animations and I did some AE compositing for this company. It wasn't entertainment related, but it's still kind of in the same kind of a production environment. Let's call it. Right. Well, I, I, I'll say this, if anything, it, it can assess to you continuing to work on your craft when there isn't available studio work, you know? So if there isn't available studio work and you having to continue to work on your craft in a real time production environment, that might be challenging. So if, you know, if you're not being picked up, so doing that kind of work, um, I, I would go, hey, that, that's something you just, you kept working, you kept your craft, you kept your skills up. And then there's probably something you learn from that kind of work, you know, forensic kind of animation or litigation kind of animation. Uh, results is probably closer to previs kind of modeling and rigging. Um, they don't need, you know, a full on high level of detail PBR style of rendering, but, you know, they, they need something that's going to, you know, showcase the timing and everything. So I assume that you've learned a lot that allowed you to move forward to your next gig. So when did you get back to a studio gig after that? After that, I did, um, I was, I did a pro bono job that um, took place at the American Legion. They were recording a short documentary. Okay. Uh, not a short documentary, it was like a film short. For uh, for director Mayan Bassi, she's mm -hmm. been she's been Emmy nominated before. But um, yeah, I was asked by a friend of mine from the BS. They said, "Hey, um, there is a there is a job that we're gonna go do at um, on, over a weekend, and if you want to come through and get some experience, that's cool. I mean, you could even add it to your IMDb. It's, it'll be pro bono though. It's up to you." I was like, "I'm down. Let's do it. Let's go. I'll be there." So I was there both days. And they were filming from morning to like till the sun went down, and um, that's when I met uh, a friend named Joshua. Mm -hmm. and he was he he's a supervisor at Crafty Apes, and Crafty Apes was the one studio that I ended up back in after uh, graduation, after you know uh, working for litigation support for that. Oh, wow. And that was, that was when I ended up on my first gig as a compositor. So for your first year, because here's here's the thing I usually do. I, I celebrate. We all celebrate our grads and say, hey, you, knew, you know, you went on to this first project and we treat it as a fairy tale story. Happily ever after. Tell me what is the hardest thing that you think students have to prepare for for that first year of getting their job, you know, for the next 12 months? What should they be thinking about based off of your experience? Um, you need to think about uh, how you're going to procure your next gig. You need to think about how you're going to um, go out and try to find your next job. I mean, I don't want to be too negative, but there's really not that much of a happily ever after. Only unless you get hired, you feel good, you feel glad, you know, but you got to think about it. The project's not going to go on for long. And if you get picked up again, that's cool. If you don't get picked up again, uh, you know, then you got to hustle up again some more. The best thing to do for that is just try to leave a good impression, man. Try to leave a good rapport with uh, wherever you were at. So and now we're in year two. Let's talk about year two, year three for you. Um, you got bigger projects. You got big things that are about to happen. How are you connecting with these studios and, and, and getting into some of these bigger projects? Um, luckily, uh, well, fortunately, I was able to get some calls back months down the line from other studios that I had worked on. Mm -hmm. as well as, um, uh, I had connected with friends that I had worked on before, you know, and one thing that helped out a lot was like, let's hang out on Fridays. Let's go hang out on, uh, uh, at lunch, you know, Hey, we're working on the same team. I don't know you, bro, but let's go hang out. Let's go chill for lunch for a little bit. Let's go talk about for a little bit. And they remembered that they kept that in mind. They were like, Hey, you know, I really did appreciate that you made an effort to like reach out 
and be like, hey, let's go hang out. You know, let's get to know each other. You know, we work on the same thing. I, I guess you could call it camaraderie, you know, just exercising some camaraderie amongst the people that you're working with. So you don't you don't strike me as somebody that says, hey, I, I learned that in the um, with what I'm doing. I just think that's who you are. Like, you know, we do that in the military, but I think you grew up that way. Is that true? Is that something that you were like always uh, bringing people together or, or aligning with just that one or two individual and just saying, like, hey, let's go get something to eat? Um, I, I mean, I, I'd say so. Yeah. I, I, I've got people that tell me that, yeah, that I, I was, you know, very amicable that I'm very amicable. I don't think so. I don't know. I don't, really, I don't really think so, so much. I'm just like, Hey, this dude's cool. Hey, let's go hang out. Or I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to eat by myself today. Let's right. Right. Box. I'm that kind of person, you know, and I'll just, mm-hmm. I'll try to talk to anybody really. And so, I mean, it looks like it works out. So what are, let's talk about some of the projects that you worked on year two, year three. Um, what did you work on? Let me see. Um, we saw a lot I, of cool stuff in your reel. I want to say, well, I, uh, during Crafty Apes, there was a lot of projects I was on there. But mm-hmm. after um, my time at Crafty Apes finished, I'd say that was year two. Okay. Um, I was able to land a gig on Zombieland Double Tap. Okay. And uh, the most memorable thing about that was, it was 17 days, 18 hour days, man. And wow. yeah, and it was, I mean, I'm, I'm cool with that. I'm fine with that. I'm okay with it. I can, I can bust it out. This is not going to go on forever. Right. You know? And it's not like they're not paying you anyway. So, right. uh, <laughs> so um, I ended up on that. Um, and then um, I was fortunate enough to get recommended to work on a documentary. It hasn't really shown up much. Mm-hmm. But I worked on a documentary uh, called uh, Becoming Led Zeppelin, where mm. I was using nuke compositing techniques to restore some old footage that this director had collected wow. for, for a Led Zeppelin documentary that he was making. And um, just fixing video, just cleaning stuff up, that, that sort of thing. Um, after that, uh, yeah, that, that, no. I'm still in year two. I'm sorry. And then in the same scope, in the same year two, one of the persons that I had met in that one pro bono job that I told you about, okay, he had become a, a sequence coordinator over at Lightstorm. Mm. And they were ramping up at that time. And I reached out to him. Hey, man, uh, if you know anybody. Oh, as a matter of fact, I do. And he knows somebody that you work with at Crafty Apes. So within a week, I was already working at um, um, Lightstorm. And so uh, this would begin probably year three, right? I think yeah. you're, yeah. Uh, Lightstorm Studio, James Cameron. Um, talk about your work there. Talk about what were some of the things that you, you were responsible for over there. Uh, that's when I went back to the visualization game. I had been doing compositing for like an entire year. For year two, it was just new compositing for me. But I was... Uh, I felt right at home going back to, you know, the visualization game. Yeah. Um, went back to like some newer responsibilities other than uh, character rig. And I, I already knew tracking by this point. I knew how to track. I already knew how to do roto at this point. You know, with all the stuff that they had going on, there was a lot of tracking happening. There was a lot of roto occurring. Um, what I liked about that job was that I took the opportunity. Uh, I, I was doing a lot of tracking and I took that opportunity to learn every other tracking software that they had that they were utilizing right there pf track mm. equalizer prior to that it, we had just i had just worked on synthize the whole time you know but i took the opportunity to um learn other systems as well as how to work linux so um and uh what i what what, what i find most beneficial about that is just like and and I say this to other people as well that in your career staying software agnostic is going to help you a great deal because uh, I took that experience into other other studios where they utilize as well other different uh, tracking systems and hey here I am I can use it. So you're learning new software at these studios. How um, much training do they give you, or is it? Is it self-training on your part to figure things out? Um, what what is what is the because each studio is going to be different, but what is the setup when you're given 
hey, this is what the software we're using in our pipeline, and we're going to teach you this. How does that work? Um, I have been, I have worked alongside uh, supervisors that will give you a quick rundown, you know, and it, as far as tracking goes, you could give a quick 30 minute rundown. And then after that, just ask a few questions, but you're going to be doing the same thing for like about a good 10 hours a day. And for me, at least, or for some of the people that I've worked on, I've seen them catch on to it like quick, like in the matter of like four hours. Okay, cool. Give me another shot to track with this same software. And you're, and at the same time, it's not like you're sitting there with amateurs as well. You're sitting there with dudes that have like done this as well. And they've been very happy to teach you like other stuff as well. Okay, cool. So let's, let's explore this, this, these two years after graduation, right? And you're working, you're also networking inside. Are you going to other events? Are you going back to the community that you started with? Yeah. Okay. I, I, I stay going with them. I keep going with them. You know, like I said, they were very appreciative of like my, my help, my assistance with whatever mm -hmm. little thing. And they still reach out, you know, they still reach out. It's not, you, you cannot forget about how you got to that point because it was uh, that involvement that kind of got you there. So there's probably no way I'm going to, I'm going to decline that I'm going right. to say, no, I can't <laughs> you know, at this point, I'm really not. And you stay, you stay networking, even if you do got a gig. And if you don't know that you're going to be in for like a good while, you stay networking. Do you take time to learn uh, new techniques or sign up for classes, even if they're short workshops? Do you do you do that, or have you done that in this in the last couple of years? Yes, I have. Um, I've had already. I've been in two different. I've had already two different opportunities to uh, uh, do some. What's it called? EPT, ETP. Okay. EPT classes, you know, and they and they. Uh, they sign you up for like some online courses as well. And some, uh, um, yeah, some online courses from, uh, from other institutions as well. So what are some of the, what are some of the uh, adversities that you're, um, that you face? Um, some of the roadblocks, the obstacles. Now, obviously you're working contract to contract. So, you know, your contract ends, they don't pick you up or maybe a studio layoff. What are some of the things that you, you would face in, in these last couple of years? Uh, just and sudden, then what were your solutions for it? Sudden layoffs. This is sudden layoff. Sometimes you just come in on a Monday and that's uh -huh. it. That's the, game, that's the day you're getting canned because mm -hmm. uh, the industry is fickle. It's very fickle. It just, uh, there's no set rule, you know, and they can just can you at any time because reasons, you know, yeah. they either can't pay you or they didn't know that they weren't going to get enough work. I've been in that situation, you know? And um, uh, just um, what I've done to kind of help myself weather that has been, um, I like I said, I just kind of stay in contact with whoever I worked with prior because chances are they're somewhere. They're already somewhere or they know someone that, that can uh, put you at a studio that can put you with, uh, with, with, with somebody. And um, I've been... I guess fortunate enough to like leave a good impression on previous supervisors where they can recommend me to their friends for starting companies, you know, and that happened to me once that they're starting companies and they can say, Hey dude, I know you need somebody right now. You're just starting this up right now. Take this dude. Like I just finished working with him. He's good. You know? So strong networking, strong networking is, is key to continue to keep that, keep yourself employed, keep yourself busy keep yourself learning and expanding on that network and, and being very consistent with that. All right. So we, we are, we're moving to start to move into that year four phase. Now, what is your title at this point? Do you put senior, I know you're, you define yourself as a generalist, but do you put senior, this comes up a lot. I'll ask my students, I go, where do you see yourself in five years? That kind of question. And they go, oh, maybe I want to be to mid-level artists. I mean, I am going, how do you know you're going to be that title? At that time, why wouldn't you be something a lot, you know, higher than that? And what do these titles mean? So how do you define yourself in terms of if there is a title of senior level this? And do you think you're think of yourself as a senior level? Um, I don't know, to be honest with you. I don't know what exactly defines mm -hmm. a senior level in like 
you know, going back and forth between like comping and doing visualization. But what I did start doing was just that um, after going from post visualization artist, which is like kind of like one thing, I just straight up call started calling it visualization artist because um, you because I found myself working in the capacity of both post biz and pre biz. Mm -hmm. so at that point, I was like, okay, you know what? At this point, I'm a visual visualization artist, and I'm gonna market myself as such whenever I try to reach out. Okay, so uh, when did you get one of the most exciting things that you told me about was the Super Bowl, the the Super Bowl uh, with Eminem, Dr. Dre, Snoop Dogg. Mary J. Blige, surprise guest, 50 Cent, and you worked on that. Um, and I think it's just cool that you're getting the opportunity to see some of these projects and the things that you're working on. And I think this happened in your year four. So talk about your year four in the, in the project. I know Stranger Things season four is in that. What, what, how did you start getting into these projects? Um, so like I mentioned earlier, there was a, a supervisor they reach out to his friend who, who has just started a company like in 2020 where they were just going to do um, working from home. And um, they they were receiving commercials, uh, a lot of commercial work. And um, they just so happened to receive one of their clients, I guess, was Pepsi because Pepsi was uh, needed pre visualization for the Super Bowl halftime show video. Mm -hmm. and that was that, I think that was a time where I started saying, OK, you know what? I'm a visualization artist because there, there was no post biz involved. There was no live action that we had to, like, put visualized VFX on. It was just, hey, we got a straight rig of Eminem. We got a straight rig of Dr. Dre and we're going to animate them and we're going to give this off to the talent. You know, Dr. Dre, Eminem, Mary J. Blige and them. And um, uh, this is the way that Pepsi wanted it done. Uh, at that time, there was also a uh, GMC commercial that we that uh, that we did, where they were featuring like their new battery, their new like EV battery for the truck, and we worked with a big old light with a big old three D scan of Las Vegas, and um, uh, that, that that was that was an exciting one because from what I understand, from what I learned, was that car companies are notorious for not liking anything, but okay. they actually liked it. <laughs> they actually liked it. They were actually very happy with the product. And when we saw the final result, um, the commercial that they made on their website, yeah, they kept a lot of the camera work that we did for them, a lot of the oh, animation cool, cool. work. Yeah. And then you uh, you move into, what were some of the projects? How did you get to Stranger Things? It was for the same company. Okay. It was for the same company. They, uh, they gave us a workload of a bunch of, uh, um, they gave us a big workload, actually. And um, the first thing I did at that company was I got back into rigging. <laughs> they asked me if I could rig stuff. And uh, there was um, there was a show that I did some rigging for them that's still in post-production right now. But um, then Stranger Things came around and uh, come to find out they needed uh, some rigging for the Demogorgon. They oh, needed wow. some rigging for like the Demo Dog. And sometimes every now and then the rigs would break. The rigs always break. They always break. You know, if the rig's not breaking, you're not doing anything. And um, <laughs> luck luckily, I was there to like help them help fix a lot of the problems with the rigs right there. I got Dan Fisk to thank for that. Hey, Dan Fisk. I got Dan Fisk to thank to thank for that. I remember like going there. There was times that um, uh, I would just get stuck, and I would go back to like some of his old class videos that I still have. And that bailed me out so much, man. I oh, really that's great. appreciate it. Uh, I don't know if he's listening, but I'm going to let him know that. I think, um, it, you know, especially at the Los Angeles Film School with our team and a lot of instructors, uh, we love to hear from you guys. And, and when you come back and, and ask questions, because I get a lot of questions, you know, over the last uh, over the last many years about just exactly what you were talking about. Um and we'd love to get back and, 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 and help you guys because we'd love to see you in your career. Uh, as you continue to move forward, because we're going to get closer to answering some questions here. But as you continue to move forward, what do you see in the last four years as a trend of what you do moving into a, a like into a different direction? Like when it comes to tools, the industry, I know Unreal Engine and real time development is starting to become part of pre and post viz kind of things. What are some of the things that you have experienced that you watch progress? Um, I think, like you said, like the tools just keep getting updated. 
new stuff comes out. But one thing I noticed, like, mm -hmm. that, um, you know, some of the, so, okay, say, for example, Adobe shows off a new way of compositing a shot. All right. And it looks cool at first, but at the end of the day, you're going to end up going back to your old techniques so for, to what you know, because um, a lot of a lot of us. Well, I mean, myself, actually, I speak for myself. I kind of mm -hmm. stick to what I know and how I know how to do some things. Right. Right. Just, I mean, the tools are pretty cool. The new features are pretty cool. They're there. You can use them, you know, but you'll still end up going back to some of like the old stuff that, you know, other, right. than, that, other than that, just. um uh virtual production and with regards to like uh visual effects yeah. using using game engines using video game engines is starting is, is it has become a, a big thing actually for uh visual effects production so you're hearing about it and seeing uh more of that happening i know like halon and third floor and zoic um they've they i see it in their job descriptions a lot for who they're looking for you're starting to see that uh, show up in studios that you're working with or that you're uh, people that you're working with yes yes it's a it's a good skill to have mm -hmm. but um i wouldn't say it should it, I, I wouldn't say it should be the only skill to have yeah but like i say stay software agnostic if you can add that to your toolbox if you can add that to your skills do it by all means so with led walls and that always you know like the the show the mandalorian um, and the way that they produce that. Um, and we've had a few talks on LED wall. Um, are you starting to see and, and understand how that's happening? Um, like in, in certain studios, are they starting to take that more seriously in their productions, the way that they want to handle it? Yeah, they are. Um, it, they really use it a lot for, um, for lighting, just to make things look a certain way that uh for environments and stuff you still you're still gonna comp things you're still gonna um uh throw rough vfx over it but um the whole like led wall lighting technique is just really good for like getting the good amount of light the good proper light on some of your uh live li on some of your live shots on some of your uh how do i call it mm -hmm. on, on, the, on the talent that's already on the shot <laughs> right right um, so one of the things I'll leave you with, and I mean, two things I'll leave you, um, is that the, great, we have our questions coming up. Awesome. So the pandemic time caused a lot of studios to go and have people work from home. Were you affected by that? And then, um, what did you see the positive results coming out of working? I mean, from the pandemic time for the studios? Fortunately, at the time when the pandemic broke out, I was with Lightstorm. Mm -hmm. like I was at the studio for like a week, maybe maybe three weeks. And then the pandemic broke out and then they had us shift to working from home in about a week. The biggest benefit from that is just the fact that if you get stuck on something, you just pop on a, a tutorial. <laughs> I, I mean, I felt embarrassed doing that at a studio, yeah. you know, because I, mean? I, yeah. I was like, man, I, if I pop on a, a tutorial right now, I hope they're not seeing this right now i don't look dumb you know but working from home um that was the biggest benefit of all like i said i could bring up some of dan fisk's old videos right right tutorial you know you got the duality of two screens and then you can right there look at what the what what, what the, how to resolve what you're trying to do so um did that cause you to uh, continue to work from home with other studios that that started to become more of a thing in the industry yeah it, it did actually because um i mean even if it was even if i wanted to right now mm -hmm. i probably wouldn't be able to um I, I would probably most more than likely be working from home uh just uh, everything's remote at the moment i guess it's beneficial for them i guess it, i guess they got less overhead you know there's a lot of factors right there and um just the convenience of it as well but um yeah i think if i wanted to right now i wouldn't be able to go back to a studio realistically and um there are some places that do want you on site you know but like you know with gas prices why would you <laughs> <laughs> well i mean it's the benefit i think it's great i think it's i think it's great for um everybody involved um we're gonna go to our q a 
Um, this has been amazing to talk with Marlon. I, I've known him for so many years. We're going to go to our Q&A, and then we're going to uh, close this out. So the first question, how do you keep up to date with tools that you need to know? How, do, how would uh, a professional, a young professional, or just someone who's in the industry, how do they keep, how would you, what would you recommend that you're doing to keep up to date on tools that they need to know? The first part would be like word of mouth uh, from other people or, that uh, you work with, other people that you know, because they come, they, they show up excited like, hey, did you check out um, After Effects new uh, Rotobrush tool, blah, blah, blah. First, you'll hear from them, right? But one thing I recommend to a lot of people to do to be able to sign up for some of the newsletters as well from some of the uh, some of the developers. And I say that because there's times where they just have like licenses of certain things for like a fraction of the price. Like for example, I was able to get a license of um, Marvelous Designer one time by just following their newsletter. Oh, wow, yeah. I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes they just give out stuff like that, you know? Um, well, actually I didn't get it for free. I got it for like 10 bucks. <laughs> but it's a huge <laughs> deal. Yeah. yeah, that was a great deal for me right there. Um, yeah, a lot of the developers they in their newsletter right there, just, um, I, I mean, that's the reason I started following the newsletter because like oh man they're giving out free licenses every now and right. then okay let's do this you know and check them out every now and then but um you'll hear it from people you work with and um a lot of students in la film too like a lot of students they would always talk about it like, especially in the cycle that i was at they were always like hey did you check out this thing right, right there and they start talking about it and just kind of go look at it yourself see if that's like something that you could use in whatever workflow and whatever discipline that you're that you're into Okay, so uh, second question, have you ever not known how to do something that a project required and then, but took the job anyway and then researched how to do it later? <laughs> yep, <laughs> yep, I sure did. There was a time I had to, it was for Stranger Things actually, Hopper. They gave us um, the 3D scan of Hopper right there, right? Mm -hmm. And they were like, hey, uh, can you clean this up? And, uh, you know, cause it was, he the, the polys on it were just so heavy and it was just tessellated to hell uh, yeah it was horrible i'm talking like maybe 67 million polygons on it and the, the system would just chug wow. and um, yeah maya i could not for the life of me decimated in maya and um i went back to some of like the some uh some of the old stuff that damien that damien zyber taught me right and, uh, i was able to decimate it in zbrush and even right then and there, I was able to like um, UV it. It wasn't perfect. It was all little squares in a sheet, you know? Right. And, and yeah, I was able to decimate that and um, export uh, displacement maps to give it the little detail. And I was like, oh my God, I, I'm glad I got through this. I'm glad I was able to get through this. Working from home, baby. Looking at tutorials <laughs> while you're at home. <laughs> And that's why I, I don't like this term, fake it till you make it, because I think you're not faking the part of researching and being a um, solution oriented, because that's the most important thing. There's no person in the industry that knows everything at every, any given time. They constantly have to research and find a solution to the problem. So being very solution oriented and knowing that you're not going to take on something that is you know, too much, uh, something that would require way out of your skill set from the beginning, like maybe programming, you know, something of uh, physics, something like that. But I think you did the right thing where it's just like, yeah, let me, we're going to figure it out. And you came up with solutions. Um, hopefully people who are hearing that jump in, take that opportunity if it, if it aligns with you. Uh, third question, is there a series that you have always wanted to work on, but haven't had the opportunity to yet? I'd have to say not so much series, maybe like more, more Marvel and Disney, not because of like the, the, the luster of like, Hey, you're working on Marvel, right. and Disney, but they push you, man. They got like, you know, you'll hear people talk about, they got these unrealistic expectations and uh, they make, they make you work more and more. But like, honestly, some of that work where you've had to like crunch, and you've had to sit there for hours. And I've, I've fallen asleep right here before just yeah. to catch some rest. You know, that legit does make you a better artist. It sucks. Yeah. yeah you're going to be tired. 
you know, you're going to stress, you're going to want to hit the keyboard against the, the, against the screen. But at the end of the day, you're going to walk out being like, okay, I, I, I got that done. Thank, thank the Lord. I got this done. And you're going to be a lot better off with it. Just knowing that about yourself, you're going to be a lot more confident about yourself. It will suck, <laughs> but you're going to be a lot more confident about yourself. And it is, I always look at that moment for if I'm starting out, when I was starting out, I wanted to take on, you know, push me and, I, and, and, and elevate me. Because when you do come out the other side, you're more you do feel like, hey, I, I'm, I'm, you know, level two, level three kind of a professional because I went through that. Or when I look at a project and it shifts and saying, um, you know how much work, blood, sweat and tears we put into that. But then you do it until you don't want to do it anymore. And you, you switch to the kind of projects that it's much more desirable for you. You just get much more knowledgeable about um, the kind of projects to choose from that as well. So it looks like uh, I don't see another question here. Um, can you just go ahead and close us out here for um, uh, what kind of projects that you're that you just recently finished on? I know I've talked about Stranger Things for but. You, you did mention that there are other things that are coming out and you did drop another project that just came out um, shortly after that. Um, I, yeah, just recently. Um, well, stay tuned for out for the uh, Avatar sequels, obviously, towards the end of the year. Yeah, uh, Avatar. I was a, I was able to get on. Um, I mean, I, there's some people that like Borderlands, the video yeah. game series. Yeah. Eli yeah. Roth has a movie coming out later on. I was able to do some rigging on that guy. It's amazing. Uh, and uh, they're uh, just recently where the crawdad sing as well. Yeah. I didn't even yeah. know what it was, but I just saw it like came out on the trailer mm -hmm. and my shot came out in the trailer. It's just, there's something really cool when you're like your shot that you worked on comes out on the trailer. And the shot that I worked on, on that one was one of those where I was like up late at night, like, Oh my God. <laughs> <I'm done." laughs> so that was, that, that was, that, that was a very rewarding feeling right there. Um. Last question. Um, what's your favorite project that you worked on and why? I'd have to say Stranger Things. I had a lot of fun rigging up them monsters. I really did. <laughs> I had a lot of fun rigging up them monsters. I had a lot of fun uh, uh, tracking the uh, tracking a lot of scenes. And just uh, that, that, that season four of Stranger Things was a very fun one just recently. That's cool. I've seen some of the, uh, the you know, some of the things especially the stuff that was associated with Metallica. Um, it was just really, really cool to see that. And it's always for us, for the, you know, for our team, Los Angeles Film School, everybody that's been involved from your day one, from admissions, from your last day with graduation, for us to see what you're doing to celebrate you and continue to celebrate you. We're forever thankful for you taking the, uh, the, the choice to go to our school and go through our program. So on behalf of Los Angeles Film School and everybody here, uh, thank you so much, Marlon, for uh, being with um, our particular show today here, what we're doing. And we are love for you to have you back. I know you've been helping me out for the last couple of years with what I do with the program. And, he, and, and Marlon, he's always, he's always my military vet guy to talk to other veteran students that come on board. So thank you so much. And thank you, Los Angeles Film School and everybody who's watching. We look forward to uh, hearing more about what you thought about today. All right, thank you. Awesome, thanks, Joffrey. Thank you, guys. here so please please go to uh, www.lafilm.edu slash tour um, if you're interested in taking a tour with our program uh, with our school find out more about what we have to offer mm -hmm.